Our guest poet tonight, Luther Hughes. He is the author of the debut poetry collection, A Shiver in the Leaves, Boa Editions, and the chapbook, Touched, Sibling Rivalry Press, uh, 2018, recommended by the American Library Association. They are the founder of Shade Literary Arts, a literary organization for queer writers of color, and co-host the Poet Salon podcast with Gabrielle Bates and Duji Tahat. Recipient of the Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship in, and uh, 92Y Discovery Poetry Prize, their work has been published in the Paris Review, American Poetry Review, Orion, and more. Luther was born and raised in Seattle, where they currently live, and is here with us tonight. Welcome, Luther Hughes. Um, thank you. I'm going to start with a song. I'm not going to sing, <laughs> um, but someone else will for us. Um, and the song is uh, Blackbird by Nina Simone. There's abuse, the hands of the thing, the nailed digits, everything in aperture, a dead animal, licking, grazing, the couch skirt against concrete, where the walls mate, the bathroom door lilts, a loose tooth in a child's gum. I watched my reflection in a sliding door, a dead animal, I watch myself crane, throat clutching sounds. Everything is allowed to pray. See the fist like shell meeting my spine, meaning slay, stretch me, relax. Something about skinned alive, when to bleed, when to bleed. Something family to human, not the bone, but the bone broken through. What's left of sounds tease the graveyard. Everything is flight. The eyes relinquish light, peel to darkness. Who prepared me? In the beginning, I was dirt, am dirt, <coughs> then molecule, then fluid, then sinew, 
I watch the body grow humongous and sing a little boy. I know it got so intense so fast. Um, <laughs> but that's for me, <laughs> to calm myself down. Um, so thanks for having me here. Thank you, Jen, for that lovely introduction. Um, so I'm reading some poems from my chat book called Touched um, that was mentioned in the bio. I never read from it, but I felt like why not start off with reading this. Um, the chat book again is called Touched. Um, there's our naked men on the cover. So, you know, just be aware of that if you're searching for it. Um, surprise my mom, for sure, but she found out. <laughs> um, I was like, yeah, you can't totally pass for that. Um, so, uh, this chat book um, is about um, a lot of things. Um, trauma, molestation, um, black violence, among some other things that filter nicely into the full-length book. Um, and you can kind of see how that's going to go. But I'll read two more poems from this chat book and then I'll jump into A Shiver in the Leaves. Tenderness. When the festival was over, I watched the crows pluck the earth until sour. I wavered, nestled the scene inside the contour of my eyes. I wasn't a violent person, had I been. Had my feet desired the reverb of the fowl's hollow, I would have fled. Instead, I write, my brother's forced sex relax in italics. Being a beast of craft, I grew ill. Gave my earth to a man with no parade in his body. It didn't matter. The man clipped my pelvis at the smile, searched for the muscle, a familiar rummaging. Outside his window, perched atop a pine tree, my brother watched. The jailed under pink exposed, the swift choke flattening the neck, the flourishing of him, him, him. How wild to watch an animal die. Do nothing. When I speak of cruelty, I mean do nothing. I confess. I craved my brother gutted. Let me take the crow's toothed black, bury it. Um, so something to say here, which I say all the time because people should just know this. Um, I'm obsessed with crows, um, like highly obsessed, um, to a point where I told myself no more crow poems. And you know, if you read the book and you see a bird, it's not a crow, guarantee it was a crow first. And then I edited it out for something else. Um, and why do I love crows? They're just so smart and intelligent, but also they're black birds and I feel like very keen to blackness in that way. So I'll get to the crow poems after this actually. Alternate ending with weeping. But I am human. I repeat it, finally, without him inside me. This open space where once was skin, was a pulled back shirt, was hands combing. Behind there was a backyard of things. I couldn't tell you now, I'm sorry. I'm sure he was good. He said it sometimes when kissing, but without actually saying. He would force a bend of me, a degree to which meant welcome. I didn't know then. If anything, I was twinned at the mouth. It was slender beside me, an empty fireplace, that abyss growing less happy. You have heard it before. Relax. Relax. I instructed nothing of limbs, legs arms, unballed fist. I had to expand from the inside, be brighter, a window half split to dawn's rituals, sunlight knitting the basket of trees, windows, the melodies sitting on the sill, a man reading on the front lawn across the street. Tenor, after Jean-Michel Basquiat. Crows <laughs> and more crows. <laughs> One crow with a rat hanging from its beak. Another crow with its wings plucked empty. I wanted so much of today to be peaceful. But the empty crow untethers a feral yearning for love that is so full of power of tenderness, 
The words fall to their knees, begging for mercy like tulips in wind. I don't wear the crown for the time's power has tainted my body, but I can tell the difference between giving up and giving in. If you can't, ask the crow that watches me through the window, laughing as I drink my third bottle of wine. Ask the sound the tree makes when the crow has grown disgusted with my whining after years of repression. I can come clean. I was a boy with a hole other boys stuffed themselves into. I have wanted nothing to do with blackness or laughter or my life, but about love. Who owns the right, really? Who owns the crow who loves fresh meat or the crow who loves the vibration of its own throat? Everything around me is black for its own good. The widow, the picture of the boy crying on the wall, the mirror with its taunting, the crows that belong to their scripture. Can you imagine being so tied to blackness even your wings cannot help you escape? About my life, every needle a small prayer, every pill a funeral hymn. I wanted the end several times, but thought, who owns this body really? God, dirt, the silly insects that will feast on my decay. Is it the boy who entered first or the boy who wanted everything to last? In case you didn't know, um, I'm extremely queer. Um, so the poems are also extremely queer. And so, you know, not to say if it triggers you, you can walk out, but like if it triggers you, just don't walk out. <laughs> um, it's also funny because, um, um, so I came out as non-binary maybe two, three months ago, and this book is so not non-binary, it's so homosexual gay, and I'm like, oh, this is me as a boy, this is very interesting. Um, and it's like, re it's like relearning myself, that's not myself anymore, given that I'm no longer a gay man, I'm a non-binary person, so it's interesting reading these poems to you all. The dead are beautiful tonight. Even the hemlocks moan, black rind, Black faces, winter's stern grip of their necks. They say it's the worst one yet, but they've all been the same. The dead die every year, and I think I'm too good for such repetition. I've gained so little this season. The things I've lost stay in the day a rough stillness. I don't tell him this, but I want my life to end. He wants another hallelujah in bed with me, and I don't blame him. Our lives are so ridiculed with pining. I used to want the romance of hemlocks, the subtle conversation between the sky and crows. I can't help but study things that bear my resemblance, and that makes me a narcissist, I know. But the crow, headless in the bush, has been there all week, and if I can't bring it back to life, what else am I supposed to do? So much is my want for everything black around me to live, but where does want get me? I have my limits. My childish dreams barreling into the mind's murk I want, but I must be careful. A shower here or a shower there, the hemlocks will still be a spider's web of what was. It's true what they say about the day disrobing into a sudden stroke of sorrow. I unthread and he arranges me on the bed how he sees fit, ready to love me the blackest way he knows how. Salt in my mouth, light in the corners of my eyes. So I'm gonna read the uh, title poem of the book. And for those who don't know what that is, I'm sure you already, you're all smart. Um, it is the poem that shares the same title as the book itself. It doesn't mean though that the poem is the crux of the book. It shares the same title for obvious reasons, given the same themes. Now it's a workshop. Okay. <laughs> a shiver in the leaves. 
Are you? Are you? Coming to the tree Where the dead man called out For his love to flee Strange things did happen here No stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree A must of flies showers his open mouth Where the blood crests Dead, he will not speak I can see how pain chewed the neck. I rest my head against the tree's sleep and wake in his call like legs of a spider. His nature extends saying like you, I once harbor beauty saying like you, my beauty takes the kingdom of blackness. It is dawn in the man's eyes, a cavern, a slow thaw to memory. I look and look and look, who is to say what death is or not? He has his limbs, a sky overlooking. I know he is dead, nothing will change, but still I whisper in his ear, breathe. I want you to breathe. <laughs> if for those who don't recognize those lyrics, <laughs> They're from um, Hunger, Hunger Games Part 1. Um, I don't know why I chose those lyrics from that book. I haven't even read the book, um, but I just saw the movie. I was like, this is so cool. I'm going to use this for my poem. And there's nothing in the poem that relates to that movie at all, which is to say, nobody cares about what you use in your poem. If you like it, put it in there. Um, people will love it. As the fog rolls in, night finds its footing. What's that story about the blackbird visiting a man? Or, more accurately, his depression, making him recognize it, I mean. It was often like that with birds, reminding me of my flightlessness. It was like that, then more so, than only that. I'm doing as much as I can these days, despite thinking about what ails me, going on walks, Slipping into bathroom stalls with strange men who become not so strange when they pull down their pants. Without wanting more from absence, if a thing can even be considered absent, not having been there to begin with. If not a black bird, something that was blackened by blackness, with an animal understanding was in his room. Above, it had wings. No, it didn't. a few more. Ah, a few more, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Prayer. After many years away, Seattle is everywhere. The fresh faces of the evergreens, the crows that kiss the sky. I was once the sky. I ran over the heels of my body with the son of a man who killed himself. I've been thinking about what suicide means. My friend says there are many ways to commit without dying, and there's joy in that. I ask myself, do you want to die from your hometown? I don't want to die, I mean. It's too beautiful this summer, and I want to see another like it. The bluebells, the cardinals. This morning, my mother called again to say she loves me. I was annoyed, I admit it but I think she is dying and doesn't want to say. The last time I saw her, she was limping. She didn't think I'd notice her face sinking into her skull, still beautiful, blush. When she hung up, I opened the blinds. I want to die with the city pouring onto my deathbed, to the floor, then out into the hallway and into another room where it can lay its head on the pillows of others, unbound by my bullshit. Have you ever seen more than one cardinal at once? I've Googled, are cardinals lonely birds? I know what you're thinking. Yes, I miss Seattle. I miss my mother. I miss my father. I never call. Last night, I dreamt my father and I stayed up all night watching his grandson do backbends, cry and laugh. 
Long black hair swooped into a bun. My father is alive. Did you know? Sometimes I talk about him as if he has died. When the man killed himself, what was he thinking? When people jumped out of the World Trade Center, read from the combustions, cardinals, lonely wings, never mind. I don't want to go there. I'm always trying to escape too many places at once, flying out of a cage and into another. I should mention that I mentioned um, my father's grandson in that poem. That is not my child. I do not have a child. <laughs> um, so you're like, oh my gosh, Ruth is so young. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm so young. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to read uh, three more from the book and a new poem that I've never read out loud that came, uh, I don't know, within the last year. Um, Yes. Dearest, Ben Kaida, Seattle, Washington, 2017. He was missing, and nobody said to look for his light. It wasn't asked, but suicide was mentioned. Lynched first. It's morning. From my window, I watch a teenage boy sitting under a dead tree toss a basketball into the air. I wonder about the boy from the article, the tree he belongs to. I want the dead tree to be maple, to be both memory and like a moon hanging in the afternoon sky here. It is hanging, right? Not hung. I mentioned morning. I haven't forgotten. Notice how the sky swells into a white flag when we're not looking. How the clouds shackle with weary. The choice to give up can be difficult. I know. I once watched a cockroach swim in a sink full of water and then with some glimmer of promise, stop. The choice was so simple. Someone called that cruelty. Someone saw his face and said, this creature isn't meant to live. I have thought myself a creature worthy of death. Alone, listen to the city tear the night. I am worthy, I tell myself. I touch my face for a brief moment and the city begs me to live. There is this breath I take, the meditation of the trees. Which one is strongest? Which one can carry a boy, brags when he becomes a museum? Maple? Douglas fir, black cottonwood. In Seattle, the wind is tender, at times foul. It lifts me up against the closest tree, and the tree, like a bell, rings. Mercy. Peeking through the clouds, Mount Rainier with its white tank top, several cities to glare upon, and a more blue sky to angle into must love by now to be American. When asked this by the woman in front of us on the night President Obama was elected, my mother and I in Walmart, isn't it a great night to be American? The cashier just nodded, but my mother yelled, yes, it really is, thank God. And yes, it was a great night to be American to be there between the bags of legs and plague of batteries, to be black in America, thank God. But oh, mountainous beast, who am I to thank now? Years later, walking home from the bus stop, surrounded by midwinter eating trees and new rise condos that my love was a shot at work today, mistaken as someone else. Is there a song for this strain of mercy at home? The light flickers above us as we sip wine, letting the TV wash our bodies into quiet laughter. I know we should spend this time spitting on the name of America, how we usually do, when black people have been killed or when other country perfumes with our war, but there's beauty unaccounted for tonight. There are crows out back, tired from the work of flight 
and pilgrimage, ashing the branches one by one. There is the crock pot of red beans in the kitchen, its chestnut chest bubbling with bay leaves and sausage. I fear I have made a mess of being an American. Love, I'm dumb with the fear of never doing enough. Is there anything she wants to say about what happened today? I ask him. He takes a spoonful of home into his mouth. The laugh track on TV peppers the room and he shakes his head. What did I expect him, black like me, American like me, in love like me to say after dusting a day along to get inside this four wall pasture amid the morning of dirty laundry, the painting of a cracked moon guarding the wooden black dresser? Like the food, he asks. Yes, I do, I say, and I kiss him on the cheek. Thank you. Okay, one more before the new one. My mother, my mother. When I was a child, I would run through the backyard while my father yanked dandelions, daisies, thistles, crab, grass, mold, rearranged the stones around the porch. The task of men, though I didn't know. Blushed with cartoons and chocolate milk one Saturday, I found a bee working a dandelion for its treasure the way only God's creatures can, giving and giving until all that is left is the act itself. And there's faith too. My mother used to say in her magnolia lilt, it comes as it comes, there's a road to follow. When I swapped the bee away from its fortune, my father, knee drenched in manhood grins, and his gold tooth glistens a likely tale. And when the bee stings my ear, I run to him screaming as my mother runs outside, hearing her only child's voice peel back the wallpaper. She charms my ear with kisses. This afternoon, I notice the bee trapped inside the window as my mother on the phone tries to steal her voice to say her mother has died. I wonder if he can taste the sadness the man on TV tells the other. The bee is so calm. The room enlists a fresh haunting and the doorframe distracts. To believe her when she says, as the bouquet of yellow roses on the dresser bows its head and the angles of my clay bloom with fire, it'll be okay, is my duty as her son. My mother sits in a hospital in San Antonio motherless. My mother is now a mother without the longest love she's ever known. My mother used to wake up before the slap of sunrise with my father to build new rooftops. My mother who wrote, I pray you have a great day on stupid notes tucked in my lunchbox. My mother who, <laughs> my mother who, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that's just funny to me. My mother who cried at the airport my, as I walked through customs, yes, seeing the woman who asked, first time moving from home? My mother looks at me with a glinted simper when the pastor spouts disobedient children. My mother was told at a young age she'd never give birth, barren as she were. My mother, my mother, what rises inside me, I imagine inside her, although I've never had a mother leave this earth. I've never been without love. So I have maybe wrote maybe 10 poems since the book was accepted in 2020. So um, these are all relatively new, but I'm reading one today. Um, and don't you know, assume a new book is coming anytime soon because I highly doubt it, um, but I do feel good writing poems again in a very special way. There comes a point. There comes a point when the heart at last becomes what was rumored. What more could I want? The monkey puzzle tree? The black chinned hummingbird? I'm tired of the sound the heart makes. I miss wanting to die. I don't know what makes love love, but I knew Jesus. The TV freezes. I pour you another glass of vodka. This poem wants to be about you. I once wrote, I want, but I must be careful. In a poem so large, I forgot it was about desire. This poem was about a glass of water vibrating in heat. 
They say the heart knows all. I want, but I must be careful. When I read care, I think of you filling the kitchen sink with water, placing your plants in one by one. When I read want, I mean blatching hummingbirds are territorial, and you belong to me. And the light flying from the kitchen sink to the wine glasses to the open window is a metaphor. When you read metaphor, do you think of truth? I don't know what I believe in is a type of faith. The truth is, you are my religion, my thumb drum well of the heart, my lavender candle burning itself thin. A poet writes, imagine love as a horse. I have a different theory. Instead of as a horse, think like a tree. Instead of imagine, think treat. There, just like that, the coach's throw pillow, the dog's infested hair, the blue and white coaster, yes, yes, treat us, this poem and this house perfume with love. Imagine us as light. Thank you. <laughs> Q&A time. Any questions? about the poems or anything, life. I'm here all night. <laughs> yeah? Well, I loved all your poems. Oh, thank you. They're really great. Um, when you're writing about really heavy topics like suicide or you know, abuse or sexuality, like where, what drives you to share that? And where do you tap in inside yourself to share that kind of thing? Thanks for that question. I get that question kind of a lot because um, I was told my poems are very vulnerable. I didn't know they're vulnerable um, in that way that they are. Um, so I'm able to tap into that because I write poems for myself first. Um, and I need to figure out how I feel a certain way about an experience I had in my life. Um, and poetry is the best way for me to do so. Um, and so I go to the page without even thinking about what the poem's gonna be about. I don't think about where I wanna go. I just write the poem. Um, and somehow it gets to where I need it to go. Um, I think for me, writing is actually in the editing process. And that's where you can figure out what the poem actually needs and where you want it to go. But first draft, I'm just writing the poem. Um, and wherever it takes me, it takes me. Um, so that's how I'm able to do that. Now, when it comes to actually publishing it, um, that's a little scary. Um, but I think, you know, learning that poems and poetry is more than just yourself allows you to have the confidence to publish a poem that is so deeply vulnerable because others might feel that same way that you don't even know. And so once I found out that people have the same experiences as me or like we're going through those same things as me or just said thank you for writing that, I learned that publishing is more than just publishing. It's an act of community service sometimes. And so for me, it's all about doing that service to other people. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah, thank you. Other questions? The sky's the limit. Do you have like a, a process for when you're writing poems? Like as something like a, a mood or a place, something that like brings out your poetic heart? Yes. Um, don't crucify me, but I believe in the muse a lot. So I don't really go to the page with a thought or a line. Sometimes maybe a title, um, maybe an image, but usually I allow myself to live my life. And then while I'm living my life, things come up to where I'm like, okay, the poem is not there yet, but it's coming soon. I can feel it coming soon. And so once the muse is like, Luther, I think it's talking about a poem, but I sit down with the poem. Um, I also will say that uh, part of my process is to gather like poems or medias around the poem I want to write. So if I know I'm writing about my father, I then look at other poets from the father before and, go, and read their poem and say, you know what, like, this isn't the first time this is happening or a poem about a father ever written. Someone's did it before too. So I'm gonna read their poem, read their magic, and then get kind of inspiration from their magic and like make sure I'm understanding how to do so. Because a poem, writing it every time is always difficult, no matter how long you've been doing it. And so I think knowing that others have done it before me makes it easier to sit down and write a poem. Um, and so it's important for me to like gather other people around my space. Um, to like learn from them while I'm writing the poem I want to write. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, they, I'm curious about you know, the image of the blackbird and the crows and, and the, the bird imagery. Uh, I'm just curious about how you happen to start. I mean, uh, Nina Simone's song, Blackbird, of course, is a famous, powerful song. 
Uh, but I'm just curious about how you kind of, uh, how that image kind of evolved into the poetry. I mean, there are other things that are black too, but they're black bears and whatever, you know, but the black birds that have a special significance for you. Um, so, I'm from Seattle, and as you probably all are aware, that Washington State has a lot of black birds, specifically crows. Um, and Seattle is known for them a lot. And so um, when I was, uh, I want to say, maybe in grad school, um, writing Hardy's poems, um, the thesis, um, my friend had gave me a prompt, I believe, um, that included either the prompt included a bird or his response included a black bird or a crow. So I just took it. Um, and then I realized, oh, St. Louis is a house. I was school St. Louis for grad school. They didn't have a lot of crows. And so I began missing crows, which I, mean, I was missing home. And so crows became a reflection of home, which of course became a reflection of trauma because home was always had to, you know, trauma or whatever. Um, and so that's kind of how it started. But then it evolved the more I studied crows, the more I thought about blackbirds and birds and what they um, symbolize and what the crow symbolizes and how crows are seen as nuisances, right? Um, the same way black people are. And so I began to kind of think of between black people and crows a lot. So that allowed me to really uh, evolve the symbolism into a much more personal space. It's not only about the crows being out and about, but they're right next to me, right? And so, um, yeah, it just became sort of a go-to, um, almost a crutch, um, but I really believe that um, if I was not thinking about home, I could not have read about crows at all. And so I became obsessed with them, and I'm, firmly believe I'm a believer that your books if you want it to be, it can be so tied to an obsession and that be okay. Like we're human beings, we obsess over a lot of things. And so why can't my book and poems also have the same obsession because I obsess over things. And so, um, that's your question, so Holmes. Kind of yes. <laughs> it does, yeah. It does. And because of that, I'm able to now then study other birds. Like because of like my crow obsession, I think has been fulfilled. I'm able to like get a book on birds. I can, be a fake bird, I can listen to the bird podcast. I'm not a bird at all, um, but my mind I'm a birder. Um, so all that has allowed me to further my craft in other ways that I think the crow couldn't have done um, if I did write about it so intently. So now I'm like so attuned to a lot of birds now. Even bird was chirping outside. I thought, I was like, oh, bird chirping outside. So I'm so attuned now to birds and trees because of the obsession with the crow itself and fir trees because of Seattle and home and all those things that it involves. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if this is a question, but um, but somewhere when I was reading about you today, I, I did read the word queer, and I didn't realize how happy that made me. Because I'm 70 years old, and it's okay for my partner here, but 76, and like, you know, when you said that there are there are these words that you love, like I cannot at this point in my life now, I cannot hear that word enough. I can hear it 500 times a day, and I don't think I'd be full. And it's because I had to like not hear it so much in my life. Mm -hmm. And like, and if we did say it, or if we did say other words that belong to us, like lesbian or gay, even gay was sort of the polite word, you know, but um, <laughs> back then. But um, but like so, we always had to expect a reaction, you know, like like we'd either. You know, maybe we'd get support, but like maybe we'd get the stiffening or the, you know, it's like it just couldn't be a word. So when you said um, non-binary, did you say non-binary? You said non-binary, and that's a, that's a newer word for me, but I still want to hear it so many times. But anyway, you just made me feel really good, and um, we've been sitting over here looking at your book, and it's really beautiful, and, um, you know, thank you. Oh no! Thank you, thank you. That was pretty. Um, so queer, queer, queer. Yeah, all of it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so funny that you know once you begin saying something that the definition switches in your mind, right? Like it becomes a whole new thing to you. It becomes very liberatory to say something, which I which is why I am so vulnerable. I think because you know if I couldn't be vulnerable or couldn't say, hey, I want to commit suicide, then I'm not allowing myself to grow past that. I'm just sitting with that. And so I think um, it's important for me, for sure, who is someone is queer and black and you know, has other obsessions, like to say and name the thing, which is why I name birds a lot and trees a lot, because I'm, I'm reclaiming what 
was initially mine at all, right? The trees were not a black person's friend, but now they can be if I say a maple tree or a fir tree or a Douglas fir, right? And so I think naming something in your poems or even in the world is so powerful. And it's important to show care to people around you and to the nature around you because we're not above any of the nature around us, right? Or above any other person. And so, yeah, so thank you for saying that. I really appreciate that. Other questions? Oh, yes. Kind of on the same lines, you, as you were kind of looking through your poems and going, oh, this is, this is kind of an old, <laughs> I'm looking at an old me, um, and you mentioned on, or now being on binary and a bit of a shift. So how does that now change the way you, you see yourself in, in writing or inform the ways going forward as you're writing poems? Yeah, so I guess I'll just say the secret. Okay, so um, <laughs> Sorry, that was so the so I guess I can only explain it through this way. Um, so the between us in the room, <laughs> the uh, book I foresee coming is about home and domesticity and being one in one's body being home. And so that is because I realized I was non-binary. I think, and I realized that it's important for me to discuss home in a plain way um, in new poems, so I can live without being scared of myself. Um, I think um, for me, I've always known I was something, um, but didn't know how to name that something until recently. And so the, the more I got familiar with myself, the more I allowed myself to be healthier mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I allowed myself to really dig deep and be like, hey, I think I am this thing. And then so when I go read my poems now, that's um, you know, about a boy, that's still true, right? I was still a boy during that time, so it doesn't seem like it's a false me or a falseness in my experience because I was still that person, that boy, that man. Now, though, I look back on it and say, I couldn't have written this new poem without writing these boy poems, right? I couldn't have expressed myself when it comes to home without writing about being homosexual. And so, I think everything for me is it's always a process um, that, Looking back, I may not have, you know, really enjoyed it, but I think I needed to write those poems or have these experiences to get to where I am today. And I think because of that, my poems are going to become more confident and more experimental, I think, um, and less caring about how others feel about a poem. Um, I think, you know, as a writer, we evolve because we're humans, and so if I don't evolve, I'm not evolving because I'm human either. And so um, it's important for me to... Um, I don't, have to, I don't have to address my non-binary poems. Um, will I? Of course. Have I already? Of course. Um, but that, is, that doesn't, mean, it doesn't need to be the main focus. The focus is the idea of home, right? And feeling comfortable in one's something, whether that is in a domestic space, whether that is in your body, whether that's, you know, in some food. And I think that's where my poems are going and moving towards, like a, a safeness, I think. Oh, wow. Yes, I was. I lived in Galveston as well. However, I was lucky to get to the, the central, so very close to like Santa Cruz, Berkeley, like yeah. back in the way back before you were maybe um, yeah, have a connection to some extent. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm born and raised in Seattle. I moved there, moved away from there for college when I was like twenty something, but moved back there. Yeah, born and raised in Seattle. Then my family is currently in San Antonio, my mom's side. So So they went there from Yeah. No, no, I was born in Seattle. I, I visited San Antonio. I'm I'm born and raised in Seattle. Your mom, is she from San Antonio? No, she's from New Orleans actually. She's where? From New Orleans. Oh no, New Orleans. Is that I yes. Kind of yes. Look at, you know, yeah. Yeah. I don't like place. I have an issue with like things of place in a, in a sense of national. I used to also really hate place poems. Like, okay, hate is a strong word. I didn't see them for me for a long time. Um, place poems. I never wrote about Seattle actually until I left Seattle and was like, ah, right. Seattle. Um, and so then it became my whole book, right? And so um, <laughs> it's funny how things happen. You know, the things you don't end up liking then becomes your thing. Um, I used, to, I used to really hate literal images, and in grad school, I was like against the literal images. You know, like this is the, like the, the the water bottle is brown. I hate stuff like that. 
But of course, I took a class on it, and then I liked it a lot. Now it's all very much from now on out, right? So, um, you know, if you're like, ah, please. Yeah. You know, just, you know, I would say lean into it. And then you can still hate it, but you know, you can appreciate it, I guess. Yeah, I do love that too. So it's kind of weird. Yeah, that's very nice. Other questions? Okay. I think that's. That's been recorded, right? Do you have any chocolate and books here? No, I have neither here. You have none? I have not. Yes, I have neither. Um, but you can get it online. <laughs> um, you can just Google my name. Okay. Yeah, okay. Buy it from Inklings. No, I'll find it. Yeah, there you go. Or, or from Ellensburg Local Bookstore. Local bookstores, yes. Yeah. Is it being recorded? Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. I just wanted the picture. I need to picture. Okay. Thank you all so much. <laughs>